Good evening. Welcome to East City Bookshop. It is so nice to see everybody. My name is Emily Summer. I am the book buyer here at East City Bookshop. Um, and if you've ever attended any of our events before, you know that I say that as the book buyer, I don't have to come to any of the events. I am not an events manager. So I only come and introduce those um, that are particularly captivating, like, like our event tonight. We hope that you'll come back if it is your first time or your fifth time. Please check out our calendar of other similar events online. Sign up for our e-newsletter if you have not already. We only send it about once a week, so hopefully it's not not too much. And please also check out our social media. We are also delighted that this event is being live streamed for those of us who cannot be in the shop. So if you're joining us from home, we are delighted that you're here as well. Before we get to tonight's conversation, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you need a restroom, it is upstairs past the register and the greeting cards. We will have time for question and answer at the end of the conversation. So please hold your questions until then. And I'll ask that you give your questions without a microphone, so please speak up. And I've already asked Tim and Jonathan if they will repeat those questions into the mic for the benefit of our friends who are watching at home. And I told you that the bathroom's upstairs. More importantly, if you still need a copy of the book, 
that is upstairs as well. And we've got plenty of copies. And now for the reason that we're here. Tim Alberta is a staff writer for The Atlantic, the former chief political correspondent for Politico, and has written for dozens of other publications, including The Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, and Vanity Fair. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, American Carnage, on the front lines of the Republican Civil War and the rise of President Trump. He co-moderated the final Democratic presidential debate of 2019 and frequently appears as a commentator on television programs in the U.S. and around the world. He lives in Michigan with his wife and his three sons. And as you know, he's here tonight to discuss his latest book that just came out on Tuesday, The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory, which examines the state of the evangelical movement and its influence in America today. In conversation with Tim is Jonathan Swan, a political reporter who joined the New York Times in 2023. He previously covered the White House, Congress, and campaigns for Axios. He won an Emmy Award for his 2020 interview of then-President Trump. And in 2022, the White House Correspondents Association presented Mr. Swan with the Aldo Beckman Award for overall excellence in White House coverage. He has previously worked at other publications, both in the U.S. and in his native Australia, including The Hill and the Sydney Morning Herald. Tim and Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. Over to you. Thank you for having us, Mr. Swan. How are you guys doing? Thanks, all, thanks everyone for coming. What especially an energetic to, crowd. To, um, My goodness gracious. To Tim's mum. How are you? It's so good to see you. Um, we do this every four years. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking, um, firstly, actually, before I sort of start, I want to say truly, um, and I got an early copy of this. It, it wasn't like a quick read. I've been reading it now for maybe a month, Tim. Yeah. When did you send it to me? Yeah. I think I really mean this. I think this is going to be one of the most important books of this period. Um, I think that so many of uh, the trends that we see in our politics um, are explained in this book uh, th through the lens of this book. Um, I, having covered Trump myself for a while now, um, often go to these events and see this kind of apocalyptic rhetoric used this book kind of really helped me think about the context of that the larger context of, of of what's surrounding this and you know we hear this language of a spiritual war um and it's becoming less and less metaphorical as time goes by i mean you saw the christian iconography um on january 6 2021 and anyway tim has been on the front lines of this for a long time but i i think this is going to go down as the, one of the most important pieces of work that Tim ever does. Um, he, he really, it's an in, introspective piece of work. Uh, it's a painful piece of work. There's, it's very personal. Um, and I just, I can't commend this book any more powerfully than, uh, than I am right now. Like you, you need to read it. You should give it to people. It's a way of understanding where we are right now and thinking about some of the forces that have led us to a, a really dangerous moment in this country. Anyone who's paying any attention to our political scene right now has to understand that. Um, and, and Tim, I think, has done a, a masterful job explaining that. Tim, the last time we did this was four years ago. It was July of 2019. And I was thinking about it, like, leading up to tonight. I actually met your dad that night. The first time I met your dad, and we had a a little conversation and um within about three minutes he was praying over me um you know, i needed a lot of praying so it was good um but you dedicate this book to your dad it begins with your dad and and i just want to i think it's important to start there because to me that's where this book was kind of born out of um so just take us back to 2019 how did you how did you embark on this journey that led to this book yeah. Um, the best place to start is at the beginning, right? Um, thank you, first of all. Jonathan, uh, you're a great friend. Um, everyone in the room knows that you're one of the great reporters in the world. And um, it's fun that we can pick this up again and maybe we'll do it another four years. I don't know. I see my wife back there somewhere probably saying, no, no, not again. Um, 
Yeah, we were we were doing this. And it's always really light subject matter. The first one was called American Carnage. <laughs> and this one is, you know, uh, how the evangelical church is spiraling into extremism. Yeah, this was so, not. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the third book will be something a little sunnier. Um, you know, we, we, we had this event uh, in the summer of 19. And yeah, my dad was there. You got to meet him. And that was actually uh, the last time I saw my dad. Um, he uh he 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 died very suddenly uh but a week later and it was funny because there was this um you have these moments i suppose where the highest highs intersect with the lowest lows and uh you have you feel like you're on top of the world and then suddenly the world is pulled out from underneath you and um that was very much the case then i had written my first book it was getting great reviews and it was selling well and and I felt great about myself and um, had my chest out and my dad sort of kept nudging me saying you know don't don't spend all of your energies on this stuff this politics stuff these people you know God's given you these amazing gifts there are so many stories for you to tell and and things of eternal consequence not just campaigns and elections kept nudging me about that in fact he met my book agent that night and sent him an email that I had not seen until relatively recently in which he pleaded with my book agent and said, don't let Tim write another book about politics. <laughs> uh, and uh, Keith uh, passed that along to me. Um, so anyway, my dad died and my dad was an amazing guy. He was an atheist uh, for many years. He was a uh, kind of a big shot in the New York finance scene and up and comer. And my mom was working for ABC Radio in New York, and they had a Cadillac and a beautiful house and a beautiful firstborn baby boy, my brother Christopher, who's back there somewhere. And um, life was great. They had everything. And except my dad thought that they had nothing. He thought he had nothing. He was completely, um, he was despairing over his life and his existence. And the long story short, um, despite being an atheist, he wandered into a church in the Hudson Valley and he heard the gospel, and he accepted Jesus, and it completely transformed his life, so much so that he decided to go into ministry. He felt the Lord calling him into ministry and gave up everything and um, and wound up pastoring, eventually, a pretty large church in Michigan, which is where I grew up. So when I went home after my father died to our church, um, as we're mourning him, uh, my family and friends, uh, there were some folks in my home church congregation who felt that that was an opportunity because my book had just come out and because I was sort of in the crosshairs of right-wing media at the time for some of my criticisms of Trump in the book. Uh, they decided to use um, the occasion of my dad's wake, the visitation, to argue politics with me, to talk about what Rush, Rush Limbaugh had been saying about me on his show, to ask if I was still a Christian, to sort of litigate Trumpism with my dad, you know, in a casket nearby. And um, as if that wasn't bad enough, the next day when I gave the eulogy and gave sort of a gentle rebuke, uh, my wife was sort of coaching me through this to try and be gentle. And um, I did try to be gentle and, and sort of offered a rebuke in my eulogy saying, what are we doing here, you know? Um, then it got worse because I got a note afterwards from someone who was a family friend and an elder in the church who basically accused me of, being a traitor and said that I was a part of the deep state and that I was undermining God's ordained leader of the country, Donald Trump, and that um, I should beg for forgiveness. And I think in that moment, for me, something that had been a problem in the abstract, something that I tried to ignore, frankly, which I'm ashamed to say now, something that I try to sort of turn a blind eye to, because nobody wants to see the, the ugly underbelly of your own tribe, of your own community, I think I was forced to confront it in that moment. And as my dad's words from our final conversations were sort of ringing in my head, it just became very clear to me that this was a project I had to pursue. As I, you know, the book sort of takes you from one church to another, from one mega conference to another, from one part of the country to another. And the experience I had reading it, there was a phrase, it's actually a phrase explicitly in your book, but it was something I was thinking about as I was sort of reading through before it got to that phrase. It was Christianity without Christ. Mm. 
And it was it was really interesting to me. And you sort of touched on it then because you were being measured not by your fidelity to scripture, but 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 by a different criteria that actually has nothing to do with scripture at all. Talk about that concept and, and also just, you know, you, you've been in so many different church environments around the country. Um, how much of the biggest, most popular uh, church congregations are scripture focused versus something, <clears throat> something different? Yeah. Well, I'll take the second part first. Um, I think it can be hard to, to quantify it, but I will say that as I write about in the book, when I have spent a lot of time dissecting that question with a lot of pastors, pastors of smaller congregations, pastors of larger congregations, pretty consistently what I will hear is that even in situations where things have really gone off the rails, where uh, there's a feeling that the church is almost like descended into civil war and the congregation is is fracturing deeply, that it's no more than maybe 15% or 20% of their congregation that has really become sort of militant and and and, become, and, and sort of turned the church into a war zone and, and injected, not just injected politics, but injected a sort of pugilistic approach to politics into the church which ties into the first part of your question about what is the standard here? You know, in chapter two of the book, I actually go back to Goodwill Church, which is the church in the Hudson Valley where my father was saved and where I was born. Uh, and my nursery was in the church manse in an old library. Um, that And this church is a historic landmark, actually, up in the Hudson Valley. If you're ever up in that area, you should visit. It's a beautiful place. And, uh, and, the pastor of that church now, who's a family friend of ours, who was there for my dad's funeral and uh, sort of joked with me afterwards about taking Rush Limbaugh's name in vain in my eulogy, he was basically almost run out of his church uh, by this sort of radicalism. He dealt with things that, I mean, it's just astonishing. Uh, obviously, I detail it in the book. And the comment he made to me that was so striking is he said, listen, you know, um, in my years in ministry, right? Like, I knew your dad was a Republican. I knew the other uh, pastor here on staff who was your dad's mentor was a Democrat. I had my own views. We could talk about these things, but it was never really all that relevant. He said, today, what we've done effectively is we've taken the biblical standard, i.e., if you are here in this body of believers with us, the standard is, do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Do you believe that he was fully man and fully God, that he was sent to earth, took on flesh as God to die for the sins of humanity and to serve as the mediator between a broken humanity and a perfect God? Do you believe that he was resurrected and that you have salvation and eternal life by believing in him? Do you believe that? If you do, then, then you are one with us in the body of believers. That is the standard. And he said, we've taken that standard and we've set it aside and we've adopted these new standards. Who did you vote for in that last election? Did you get vaccinated? Oh, uh, who do you watch in prime time? Where do you get your media from? Oh, you don't listen to that podcast, do you? In other words, all of these, all of these litmus tests that are completely abiblical have become not only the new standard, but they've also in many ways become a barrier to entry for those outside the church who in my view, uh, need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that message cannot reach them because the messengers have decided that they're more invested in other things. Just chart that for us historically a little bit. You, you sort of, you root it back to Jerry Falwell, the moral majority, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s and things gradually, you know, the evangelical, American evangelicals became more and more politically awakened, politically involved, politically engaged, <laughs> politically powerful. Um, Donald Trump arrives on the scene. That's another turning point. And then I, I suppose I knew this, but it really rammed at home in the book. COVID was just, had a radical effect on a lot of these churches. And I've experienced that myself sitting through some of these 
Christian right conferences, so much of the conversation is that moment as a sort of testing moment, yes. a moment of choosing, a moment where pastors either prove themselves to be, you know, standing strong or, you know, weak, weaklings, whatever. Just talk about that trajectory and what you see as sort of some of the key uh, turning points along the way to get us to where we are now. Yeah, I think one of the through lines that we have to appreciate here historically is um, that for any of you who grew up in the evangelical tradition, you you will have spent some probably significant amount of time inside the church marinating in messages around this idea of an eventual imminent clash between the forces of secularism in the culture, the, the godless, uh, progressive humanists, whatever the terminology has evolved, obviously, over the last 50, 60 years, those in the, in the culture who are out to get Christianity, and those of us in the church who are, are, are the Bible-believing Christians who want to preserve this nation's Judeo-Christian heritage, and that that collision is coming, and that you'd better be ready for it. Jerry Falwell Sr., built out a massive machine and mobilized an army of tens of millions of voters um, using both his massive um, uh, megachurch in Lynchburg, Virginia, using his school, Liberty University, and then using the moral majority, those three cogs in this machine. And it was masterful. And it was incredibly deft. And it was profoundly damaging. And what he did was he weaponized this idea quite effectively of they're coming for you. What are you going to do about it? Are you willing to fight back? Right. Fast forward to COVID-19. And if you have been marinating in that messaging for generations, if you have been told time and time again that you had better be ready because the test is coming and the government will come for you, they will come for your churches, they will persecute you because of your faith, COVID-19 arrives and you live in a blue state and your governor says, we need to close down houses of worship for some period of time. And suddenly, talk about litmus tests, talk about standards, all of these pastors, regardless of their theology, regardless of their doctrine, regardless of their view on abortion or sexuality or any number of things that would typically sort of plot them on the spectrum of you know, who is this person and what are their beliefs? None of that mattered anymore in a lot of these cases. It was a very simple question. Are you willing to stand and fight against the government that's coming for us, or are you going to be a coward and close the doors of this church, right? And there is an entire cottage industry now of, of, of these sort of profiteers, Eric Metaxas, Charlie Kirk, among others, who travel the country going into these churches and basically calling out any pastor or any congregant as cowards if they are unwilling to take this sort of bellicose antagonistic stand. And so much of it does trace directly back to the COVID-19 uh, moment as, as, this, as this proving ground almost. And I just can't emphasize it enough, Jonathan, for all of the turmoil around Trump and George Floyd and the the racial unrest in the summer of 2020 all, all, and and other things too that have happened covid-19 i think is going to be studied as this moment in the church i think it will be studied for centuries perhaps because this realignment now that we are living through with these congregations fracturing in real time people i've met that have been members of churches for 30 years their entire identity their entire community was found in a church and then they left like overnight because their pastor decided to close for two or three weeks because to them, that was a sign that this pastor would ultimately, that they would surrender, that, that they would not stand and fight for Christianity. Um, and I think it's just worth noting very quickly. If you came to your church on a Sunday morning and the fire department was outside and and said yeah, there's a gas leak in the church and uh it's dangerous uh you can't go in right would you view that 
through the lens of of some cosmic spiritual clash where the government is trying to shut down your church or would you view it as a very basic public health issue and say well okay we probably shouldn't go into church you know this sunday or maybe even next sunday if they haven't repaired the gas leak right you have pastors all around the country who by even when they reopened their churches saying hey can we just keep a little distance in the pews suddenly they were marxists suddenly they were woke suddenly they were the enemy and they were abetting this secularist takeover of the church and and that is if if you think i'm being hyperbolic i invite you to to read in the pages as i try to detail it that is the crisis in many ways in the church now is that it ties back to the last question about what is the standard what is the litmus test and what is it really that we're fighting over because none of this has anything to do with biblical doctrine it's all culture war stuff oh it's not even so and this this is the beauty of like reading this book and talking to tim is it, it put it explains so many things that i've observed you know in reporting that i don't think i fully understood at the time but what you were just saying then reminds you know probably two months ago i went to one of those reawaken america you know you, you write about it in the book it's basically a traveling road show of uh charismatic pastors um trump family members um former Trump officials and various other sort of people selling vitamin pills and whatever, 2000 people, you know, at Trump Doral in Miami. And what really struck me, I just sat there for two days and listened one speech after the next. It was COVID, 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 exactly what you were just saying, but it actually really wasn't even social conservatism. Like forget about scripture. It wasn't even barely anyone even mentioned abortion. It was, all about the deep state. And I just found that fascinating. No one really talked about, you know, it was all, a, it was a very politically tinged conversation, but no one was debating the finer points of, well, Ron DeSantis supports a six week abortion bill. Donald Trump is, you. no one cared about that. Mm. It was who is going to take on the satanic forces that are running this country. Is Joe Biden really the antichrist? And, and there was a a feeling that because the country is in this desperate state, all tactics are justifiable. And I just wonder how much that, I mean, I don't wonder because I read your book, but uh, for the purposes of asking you a question, um, how much of that sort of means justify the ends, you know, throw out the sort of ethics book, throw out the moral book. We can't be fussing over uh, Christian morality when we have a country to save. How much of that mindset is now infecting these communities? In many ways, I, I think this is the entire problem, as you've just described it, that there is a desperate times call for desperate measures mentality. And it, and it traces back in many ways to this idea of this is no longer partisan warfare. This is no longer red versus blue. It's not conservative versus liberal, Republican versus Democrat. It's good versus evil. That everyday partisan political disputes are now a proxy for this clash, this, this, this spiritual struggle, this holy war between the forces of good and evil. That is what you will hear at an event like the Reawaken America tour. Like he, I mean, literally, like he's not being hyperbolic like it, it's quite literally yes. explicitly that and, um, and 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 even and and you'll notice as uh, i'm sure you did um that in between the uh the speeches uh that, that are aimed at you know getting people ready for this sort of holy war you know they're pausing for prayer they're pausing for hymns but at no point uh, you made the you, you observed that you know there's no conversation about the specifics of policy right but there's certainly no specifics about about scripture. There's certainly no, I mean, for, for, for events that are at least purportedly aimed at uh, facilitating community that is based around a shared identity in Christ, right. it's completely hollowed out of its religiosity. And in fact, not to stray too far afield from the question, but I think you know, what we see happening in Ukraine right now, and I write about this a little bit in the book, but it's so, when Jonathan talks about dangerous times for America, I just want to underscore the point and, and, and hone in here for a moment. Um, 
throughout human history, it is one thing to have tyranny and authoritarianism and uh, people who want to dominate a culture, dominate a society, dominate a nation, dominate the world. And then it's another thing to have religious zealotry and, and people who can create religious justification for violence, for crimes against humanity, for ethnic cleansing, for all of it. When you take those two things and you merge them together, you see some of history's greatest crimes, right? You, you see six million Jews killed in the Holocaust at the hands of a twisted cross. You see ethnic cleansing in the Balkans. We have to understand that what's happening in Ukraine right now, for example, Vladimir Putin is not the architect in many ways of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The architect was Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, who used explicitly religious language and the language of a holy war and the language of a holy war that was rooted in really in a culture war that our values are under attack that they are the enemy they the secularists they who 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 don't you know who um who don't know god and who would destroy our way of life with their western values which is code for yeah you know all of it and mobilizing the masses of the Russian populace to support this war by effectively saying, we're not fighting bad guys in Ukraine. We're not even just fighting Nazis in Ukraine. We are fighting Satan in Ukraine, right? I think that is an underappreciated thing. Full circle back to, to your question. The rhetoric you will hear at, around desperate times call for desperate measures. Again, if you have been thinking about the American struggle the, the, the identity of America and its Judeo-Christian heritage and this, this notion that we were founded uh, as a nation in covenant almost, or in the eyes of many people, not even almost, but in covenant truly with God, like the Old Testament nation of Israel, that, that we were conceived as a nation under God and that we are divinely blessed, you will begin to fight for America as if salvation itself hangs in the balance. You will fight for America, believing that by fighting for America, you are fighting for God and vice versa. And when you have entered that sort of mind frame, when you begin to process things that way, not only is it desperate times call for desperate measures, not only are you willing to abide the behavior and the rhetoric of, of, of a Donald Trump, but in many ways, the fact that Donald Trump is not one of them, the fact that he's not bound by bi biblical virtue, the fact that he doesn't have to play by their rules, it's a bonus. Because if the barbarians are at the gates, Jonathan, you need a barbarian to protect you. So that was an... Uh, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing I noticed um, and I've noticed over the last few years listening to a lot of this rhetoric is is just that. It, you know, there was this sort of dialogue in the media um, after 2016, well, how how could evangelicals possibly support this thrice married man who, you know, pays off porn stars and, and whatever? Um, and <laughs> what I've heard so many times at these events is this prophecy, this element of prophecy with Donald Trump. And there's a whole industry of these prophets, these Trump prophets. But it's all rooted in the idea that God selected, some of them say an unbeliever. They flat out say, this is a guy who, who's not a Christian. Some of them say he is a Christian. I've heard different versions, but that he was selected for his brutality and that someone of those traits is required for this mission. And so when he does something that is, you know, he's not exactly preaching love your enemy or you know, whatever, when he does something that is completely against the teachings of Jesus, it, it validates that view. It doesn't, it's, it's not a contradiction at all. That's it's right. actually strengthens that idea. That's a, I mean, that's, a, that's exactly right. And, and I think I would be remiss not to just say, and this is a whole different speech, a whole different conversation for us to have. But I would just briefly say that for those of you who are in the audience who may not be believers, who who may not follow the teachings of Jesus, um, 
one cannot stress strongly enough that to refer to human beings made in the image of God as vermin, um, there is no biblical justification for this. If you can find me a line in the book of Proverbs, or if you can find me something in Paul's epistles, or if you can find me the red letters of Christ anywhere in the four gospels, or anywhere else in scripture for that matter, that justifies this behavior, justifies this rhetoric, I would be happy to see it, but it's not there. And this idea that desperate times call for desperate measures and our country is under attack, the entire Bible is written from the perspective of the underdog, of the oppressed, of the persecuted, of the abused, the Hebrew slaves fleeing Egypt, the first century Christians living under a brutal dehumanizing Roman occupation. I mean, read Paul's epistles, read Peter's epistles. These are men who are soon to be martyred for their faith and who are being treated in ways that we in the American Christian tradition cannot even begin to fathom the abuse and the oppression and the cruelty. And what are they doing? They're praying for their guards. They're singing hymns. They're rejoicing in their suffering because it brings them closer to Christ. So I think the American Christian in embracing their sort of imperial citizenship in this country, and let me be clear, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be an American. I, I love this country and I'm so glad that I was born in this country. But if you are a Christian, you are told time and again throughout scripture that A, the nations are a drop in the bucket and God doesn't care about them and they don't matter. And B, that your citizenship is in heaven. When Jesus talks repeatedly throughout the New Testament about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it's not an abstraction. He talks about it like it's a real place, a community, a nation almost. And he says it's binary. You can be a part of this place. You can root your identity here on earth in this citizenship. Or you can be a part of this kingdom, but you can't have both. And so this idea of Christian nationalism is a complete contradiction in terms. And I know I'm probably getting ahead of your questions, mate, but that is in many ways the core of the problem here is that you have people willing to justify decidedly anti-Christ-like behavior, unchrist-like behavior to achieve this thing, this idealized version of America because the ends justify the means. But the Bible says almost nothing about those ends about dominating the culture, about running the government, about keeping the outsiders, the secularists in check. It says almost nothing about those ends. Do you know what the Bible says a lot about? It says a lot about the means. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to the Beatitudes. Read throughout the New Testament. The Bible is very, very clear about the means mattering a great deal. In fact, your fellow Australian, John Dixon, who I spotlight in chapter six of the book, one of, the, one of my favorite people I've met in all my journeys, he gives this fabulous talk, I would invite you to try and find it on YouTube, about what it means as a Christian to lose well. Because ultimately, if you believe that your home is not here, and if like Peter, like Paul, or any of the other saints who were met with horrible persecution and ultimately martyrdom by the state, um, the idea of losing well, as he says, is core to the Christian identity because, as he reminds us, we are the death and resurrection people. One of the threads through the book that, that you do sort of structurally is you, you, you go from profiling, you know, an influential evangelical pastor who's, you know, basically a political pundit on stage, on, you know, from the pulpit who is, um, sort of radicalizing his congregants and and you know proceeding in that fashion and then you then you go to some of the there are characters in the book pastors who are pushing back against this who are trying to lead their congregations in a different direction back to the scripture what ha what's the incentive structure what happens to those pastors who take that more biblical route in this current environment you know, I talked at the outset about my father's death and how that set me on this journey. Um, I'll say the thing that really lit the fuse or, or, or at least set in motion the reporting in many ways, pardon me, for the book, was that after my dad died, we moved home 
my wife and my three boys and I, we moved home to Michigan. And what I saw happening simultaneously was my home church, where my dad had been the pastor for 25 years, he was succeeded by a, a, a wonderful young pastor, a guy who I think the world of, uh, who I've come to almost think of as a brother. He's, a, he's a, just a great guy. And he's a student of the scriptures. He's humble. He's gentle. He, he's everything you would want in a pastor. There's just one problem. He's not a conservative Republican, right? He doesn't really like guns. He doesn't particularly care about tax cuts. Like he doesn't, his identity politically is not wound up in any of that stuff, right? To the extent he cares about politics, it's because of his biblical beliefs and his principles that he takes directly from scripture. So he takes over this church and in the aftermath of my father's death, COVID-19 hits a few months later and the church in many ways starts to unravel because this young pastor decides, as did many other pastors, to close the church for some short period of time because the Democratic governor in our state, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, had issued a shutdown order that implicated houses of worship. And when he shut down the church, that made him a Marxist. It made him a, a, an appeaser. It made him a, a collaborator, whatever the loaded language is that, you know, harkens back to Nazism and everything else, right? And all these people start flooding out of the church. And not only do they leave the church, but they go right down the road to a church that I'd never heard of, despite having grown up in this town my whole life, called Floodgate. And Floodgate is this little roadside kind of revival church that had at one point about 100 people coming on an average Sunday. A fast forward a few months into COVID-19, and they had 1,500 every Sunday. And you say, well, what happened? I'm glad you asked. The pastor there, a gentleman named Bill Bolin, who I've spent a lot of time with, he decided to not only keep his church open, but to essentially use his church as a staging ground to protest what at the beginning to protest COVID-19 protocols and church closures and the like. But then pretty quickly, as he gets an interview here and a media thing there and social media starts to capture what's going on. Well, now he's actually bringing in political activists. He's bringing in elected officials. He's bringing in full-throated conspiracy theorists who have effectively transformed his pulpit into a soapbox. They've transformed his Sunday morning worship services into low-rent Fox News sets. And this is a supply and demand thing, right? To, to, to your question, Jonathan, this pastor, he saw what was working. He'd been leading a congregation of about 100 people. Suddenly, he's got a couple of thousand there on Sunday mornings, and he's thinking, okay, all right, let's 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 go with this. Let's see where it takes us. Wouldn't you know it, just a year ago, they moved into this brand new multi-million dollar facility just down the road from where they were. So they're no longer a small roadside church. They are now a mega church. And if you're curious, if you go check their Facebook stream or anything else, he hasn't let up. He's He's, you know, got his foot on the pedal still. That story of crazy as a church growth strategy, as my friend David French likes to say, that is everywhere. It is a model. It is a blueprint. It is highly effective. And I document it in some other cases throughout the book. And it's not just it's not just dangerous and damaging, Jonathan, because of because of how it undermines um, a pluralistic society and because of how it undermines secular confidence in the church. I mean, that's something I talk about throughout the book that thirty or forty years ago, according to all the the polling and social science available, non-Christians held overwhelmingly positive views of Christianity in America, overwhelmingly positive views of the church. And today, it, it's plummeted. Non-believers, non-Christians, they have incredibly negative views toward the church, specifically toward the white evangelical church. And if you ask yourself why, I think you could pretty quickly look at an example like this one and conclude that that's why. The other thing I would quickly say as to why this is so damaging when a pastor brings in a QAnon conspiracy theorist who's spouting this nonsense from the pulpit, or when Michael Flynn takes his American, uh, um, the Reawaken America tour to, you know, Trump's hotel or to any of these other places where we've seen them, and they're focused on, you know, the, the, the vaccine planting a chip in your body so they can control you, all of these things, right, that they're trafficking in. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a conspiracy theory. And the credibility of the messenger matters a great deal. 
And if you are on the outside looking in, and if you may be someone who's searching spiritually, and you're wondering about who this figure was, who historians have certainly verified and validated his experience that this was a real person who claims to be the son of God and who was executed by the state, and whose followers were so convinced that he rose three days later that they transformed their entire lives. All of these Jews who had been worshiping the Sabbath on Saturdays are suddenly worshiping on Sundays. All of these people who had been observing the laws of Moses for hundreds of years in their ethnic tribes, suddenly they've completely broken from it and they're doing something else. So if you believe that this happened, if you believe that Jesus actually was the Son of God, to lump that into the same sentence with Oprah Winfrey and Tom Hanks cannibalizing your children for sustenance, it is a disgrace. It is a disgrace to the gospel, and it is a disgrace to the credibility of the church, and it completely diminishes its ability to do what the verb is to evangelize. When you ask, what does it even mean to be an evangelical? To evangelize. You cannot evangelize when people look at you and see a bunch of crackpot conspiracy theories riding shotgun with your message about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. It just doesn't work. We have time for um, some audience questions, so stick your hand up. I'll, I'll acknowledge you and uh, shout out. We don't have the technology to give you a microphone. Yes, sir. <laughs> You think so? I thought it, was, it seems quite cheery to me. Yeah. So for people who couldn't hear in the back, the gentleman asked for some hope um, and something to lift his spirits. Um, so, Tim, can you do that? Sure. Uh, uh, I will try. Um, I'll give you three things. Um, number one, my dad's not here tonight, obviously. My dad's with Jesus, and I wish he was here, um, and I miss him a lot. My dad used to say something. He would say it all the time in his sermons. He would say it all the time to his congregants, and he would say, God doesn't bite his fingernails. And I think that's a really profound statement, um, If you, especially if you are a Christian. I recognize that plenty of folks in the room are not Christians, but if you are a Christian, God's plan for the ages does not hinge on America, and it certainly doesn't hinge on the next election. So I think that is a cause for hope. I think perhaps more concretely to the question you're asking, sir, there are two things I would say. First, the younger generations of evangelical Christians in this country, they are very clear-eyed about this in ways that their parents were not. I write in the book about the moral majority, but then I also write about the children of the moral majority. The final chapter of my book, I guess I'll give it away, why not, since we're here, um, I was with this young man last night. Uh, he's become a friend of mine. He's a professor at Liberty University. As of a couple of hours ago, he was still employed uh, at Liberty University. He has decided to go on the record with me. He is a legacy at Liberty University. His father was a friend of Falwell Seniors. Uh, he's sort of born into Liberty University royalty, part of the Falwell empire. And he, like many others in the Liberty University community, just using this as a vehicle to help explain the broader phenomenon here, he has stayed and tried to work from the inside to, to, to solve this crisis and eventually has come to the conclusion uh, that the only way out is, to, to, is just to blow the whistle and, and to say enough is enough. And so he has very bravely gone on the record in this book, and he will almost certainly be fired for it because liberty does not really tolerate dissent. The reason I'm spotlighting his story is he's about my age. And he and I and, and many other Christians who I've met around the country, I see my friend John Ward at the back of the room who has written really eloquently about these things as well. I think we see in our travels and our reporting a significant break between the moral majority generation and the children of the moral majority. If even at a school like Liberty that has had become like the avatar for corruption and, and grift and weaponizing scripture to win the culture wars and to own the libs and to dominate the, the you know the country when you spend time with the students there including the student body president who i write about in the book they're conservative theologically politically culturally but they want nothing to do with this stuff they want nothing to do with trumpism they want nothing to do with the conspiracy theories they want nothing to do with this idea that you have to hate your neighbor in order to get what you want politically or culturally 
So that gives me great optimism. I do believe that there's a generational reckoning at hand here. Um, the last thing I would say very briefly is we don't talk about this enough, but this will be the first post Roe v. Wade presidential election in this country's history. And there are millions of voters who identify as single issue pro-life voters. And because the abortion issue has been a federal one for the past half century, it has been very easy to mobilize these voters around the issue of abortion and very easy for these voters to effectively, you know, say, look, I can't stand candidate X in, in you know, obviously most recently Donald Trump, hold their nose, vote for him and say, look, at the end of the day, there's Supreme Court seats hanging in the balance. I care deeply about the unborn. This is an issue that that I don't even, you know, I don't even view it as a political issue. It's an ethical issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's a moral issue. I feel obligated then to vote for this person who I find otherwise to be completely abhorrent. Because the issue is now defederalized, because it's been thrown back to the states, I think there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty around what these voters will do next fall. Do they stay home? Do they vote third party? Do they just leave the top of the ticket blank? Um, there's a there, there's a great opportunity here for this conversation about abortion in the Republican context specifically to play out now, because after 50 years of agitating politically, after investing so much politically in this idea of, of, of stopping abortion, they got rid of Roe v. Wade and the raw numbers are out and abortions have gone up, right? So there is this question now of, for these pro-life activists, uh, people who are deeply committed to this cause, people who I know and respect and have great affection for, um, what do they do now? And does this in some way signal the end of this kind of this forced marriage, this uneasy alliance with Donald Trump? I think it's something that we have to keep a very close eye on over the next year. Do we? Yep. Do you think that what you wrote about in your last book, do you think that they realize that so, so the question is, um, does Tim think that the people he wrote about in his last book, American Carnage, thought that this is where the road led? Could you be a little bit more specific? I guess, do you think, do you think the John Boehners of the world in 2012 and 2014 envisioned the Republican Party and the conservative movement leading to a world where Donald Trump exists in this this current climate? Mm. As a, uh, so so you're asking whether the sort of old guard of the Republican Party could have foreseen Trump almost taking on this messianic. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't. Um, in fact, I had lunch with uh, Speaker Boehner a month or so ago. We happened to be in town at the same time. And and uh, I won't give anything away because it was off the record. But uh, no, he remains shocked. And I think many of them remain shocked not just at his hold on the party, but at this cult-like attachment that you see in the rank and file where voters will excuse things. I mean, Trump a few weeks ago at a rally was dropping mother effers, right? And like, and people just sort of shrug. Uh, it's not, it doesn't even register anymore. I mean, I'm reminded there's, there's a, a verse in the book of Jeremiah where the prophet Jeremiah says that the people had forgotten how to blush. And that's sort of where we are now in a lot of ways that we, we just we don't even know how to blush anymore in, in respect to Trump. So, no, I think there I think many of those folks are still shocked and trying to piece this together, as are a lot of us who have witnessed this firsthand. And, and in many ways, that's why I tried to write this book from the vantage point and, and focusing specifically on the evangelical movement, because when I was doing the tour for that book four years ago, that was the question that was coming up probably more than any other is, hey, what do you make of of, of the evangelical support for Trump? And so uh, in many ways, I suppose this was sort of a, a natural outgrowth of that. You, you talk about something in your book, you, the, the phrase you used was the Trump conversion experience. Yes. And that resonated with me because to me, some of the people I've met over the last eight years who are the most devoted to Donald Trump are people who were initially appalled by him, but had, and you gave it the the phrase, the Trump conversion experience, but 
there is nothing like the zeal of a convert. And they are in many cases repenting for having doubted him. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. I've, I've seen it. I've interviewed people who kind of, you know, not self-consciously, but really speak in that way. So, well, and, and, and I would add, Jonathan, it's an especially powerful thing for people whose lives revolve around notions of transformation, right? Um, if, if you believe that in order to earn eternal life, that you must be born again and that you must um, not, you know, it's not a casual experience. It is to, to devote your life to following Jesus and to have this sort of radical transformation of oneself and your whole life revolves around that idea, then yes, this 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 thrice married casino owning playboy who, you know, was the poster child for uh for vice and, and who you mocked openly in 2016. He couldn't even pronounce a book of the Bible, right? Um, suddenly you have the Mike Huckabees and Franklin Grahams and Jerry Falwell Juniors of the world telling you that, well, actually, there's a prophetic element to this, as you were alluding to earlier. And actually, you know, think hard about how God has used these flawed individuals as 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 vessels for the greater good. And and that's the gateway. And suddenly you're through it. And then he's fighting for you. And you're seeing the 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 enemies coming for you. And and there is this religious zeal to some of these folks who were, as you said, some of his harshest critics and who will now find this sort of bottomless justification for anything and everything that he will say and do. We have time for one more question. Who Who's it going to be? Oh, none of you, really? All right, well, I'm going to ask it then if none of you uh, have a question. I, I'm curious what you think, Tim, about how seriously we should take – we read a lot about, quote-unquote, Christian nationalism. You talked about it earlier – is it is this very fringe kind of idea that is overhyped by the liberal press? Is it something that should be taken seriously? How do you think about it? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, a few weeks ago, I was- And having... I shouldn't assume people define it. Yes, yeah. That's a, probably a good first step. So I think the problem in some ways with the Christian nationalism conversation is that it means different things to different people. The definition is a bit fuzzy. Um, I would define it briefly in, in a couple of ways. I think first and foremost, it is the belief that this country was conceived in covenant with God, that that not just that it was founded on, you know, Judeo-Christian principles, but that it was formed explicitly to be a Christian nation, which, of course, every historian worth their salt, anybody who has studied the writings and the correspondences of the framers will tell you is complete nonsense, including the correspondences of some of the most devoutly Christian framers wanted nothing to do with theocracy, wanted nothing to do with state religion. This is just not in dispute. And yet that is in many ways the cornerstone of, of this idea of Christian nationalism, that we were founded to be this thing and look how far we've drifted from it and we need to reclaim it. Right. There's a there's a tour that runs parallel with the Reawaken America tour. It's called the American Restoration Tour, which features a prominent pseudo historian named David Barton, who builds an entire homily, an entire slideshow, which is riddled with inaccuracies and exaggerations and misquotes and the like, convincing congregants around the country. And I've traveled with these guys. They've they've been to scores and scores of churches. They raise a lot of money. And David Barton will walk through the history here and, and, and say, look, we were founded to be a kingdom, a Christian kingdom here on earth. And then his partner will get up. His partner is Chad Connolly, who ran faith-based uh, uh, outreach for the Republican National Committee. He was the guy basically responsible for mobilizing evangelicals to vote for Trump in 16. And then Connolly will get on stage after Barton's fake history, and he'll say, well, you heard what my friend said. We were founded to be this Christian kingdom. And now it's being overrun by the enemies. What are you going to do about it? Right? So that is the, the, the sort of call and response uh, of Christian nationalism. It is this idea that, that we are to merge really two kingdoms into one here on earth. This question of, you know, how threatening is it? I don't want to sound alarmist. Um, because I do think that this is a decided minority. Um, 
I'm hesitant anymore to call anything fringe because I think as I documented in my last book, American Carnage, which is probably, you know, available on paperback somewhere, you know, around here. I'll happily sign that one for you too. Um, that was shameless, wasn't it? I'm so sorry. Um, as I documented that book, you know, the fringe can become the mainstream very quickly, right? Very quickly. And we've seen that. The, the characters who have hung around Trump and more to the point, as Jonathan has reported beautifully, uh, along with his colleagues at the Times, see Shane Goldmacher, my dear friend back there and others, a second Trump term, the people he would be surrounded by are like to the fringe of the fringe, right? So I do believe that Christian nationalism is a, is, a, is a minority movement, a decided minority movement. But I also think that there are some powerful and influential people who are a part of that movement who have the ear of the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who have the ear of people who will be filling uh, some of the most prominent positions in, in another Trump White House and who will ultimately have the ear of Trump himself. I do not think it is coincidental. A couple of weeks ago, I had been talking on the phone with someone who very likely could be the chief of staff for Donald Trump uh, if he returns to the White House. And we were having a conversation about policy matters. And this person returned time and again to this idea of these policy disputes being essentially a proxy for good versus evil and how this person said that they would not define themselves as a Christian nationalist, but are certainly sympathetic to the ideas. And we kind of went down that rabbit hole a bit. The next day after that conversation, Donald Trump was campaigning in New Hampshire, and he floated this idea that maybe we will start imposing a religious litmus test on migrants coming to the country. Maybe we'll only let Christians in from now on. No Jews, no Muslims, no Hindus. Now, he did not say this part. I'm, this is an addendum, my own addendum. But no Jews, no Hindus, no Muslims, no atheists. If you're going to come to this country, you're going to be a Christian. Now, that is a, a, a core tenet of the Christian nationalist platform, as is a public statement that was signed about a year ago, year and a half ago, by a couple of hundred very influential conservative Christians. And that statement of principles that came out of the National Conservatism Conference, that statement of principles had a whole section on religion and public life. And it was all but an endorsement of theocracy. It say, stated very clearly that, that, that citizens will enjoy uh, refuge from state religion when in their private lives and in their private homes, right? So, so, so this stuff is real, and it is out there. And the fact that Donald Trump could float that sort of religious litmus test and say, we're not going to let non-Christians into the country, it's the sort of thing that would have shocked us at one point. And I don't think it even made the news cycle. I, I mean, I only stumbled onto it scrolling Twitter. I didn't see it really get a lot of attention. So I think if nothing else, we have to be very vigilant about uh, how real this is, because even if it is a minority, a small minority, which I believe that it is, uh, that small minority, I think, is punching way above its weight in, in terms of influence and in terms of power and proximity to power. And um, that's something we should be concerned about, whether you are a Christian or whether you are not a Christian, if you are invested in the idea of a healthy, pluralistic society, uh, you have to be on guard against this. You just have to be. I'm sorry I've gone long. Um, let me, uh, you, you can have the last word because you're far more eloquent. Let me just say thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really I'm grateful that you're all here, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm so long-winded with my answers. Um, I see some of my colleagues smirking like, yeah, of course you are. Um, Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm really grateful that you guys came out. I'm happy to sign books and just have conversations with you. So thank you. And thank you to my dear mate here, uh, Mr. Swan, who's uh, as good as they get. And, and I'm grateful to you, brother. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I don't have anything else to say, but um, I, I hope you buy the book because uh, really, I, I, I mean what I say. I, I don't... Uh, I'm not using hyperbole when I say I really do think this is one of the most important books of this period. I do think we'll look back on it as something that explains this time better than almost anything I've read. So really can't endorse it any, any more strongly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim and Jonathan. Thank you all for being here. My least favorite part of any event is when I have to come and cut off such a um, captivating discussion about such an important topic. Um, as Tim said he is willing to sign books. We will just take a minute to regroup, reset, and ready the space for a signing line. If you are willing to do your part and help us 
fold up our chairs and just put them to the side. That would be great. And that'll give us all room to line up here for the signing line. Um, if I move you through the signing line, please don't take it out on Tim or the bookstore. I'm just trying to protect everyone's time and make sure we all get through the line. There are plenty of copies of the kingdom, the power and the glory, as well as American carnage upstairs. So we appreciate the shout out. We do want people to buy, buy both books. So thank you all for being here and we will, we'll be ready to sign shortly. Thank you.